from the SiliconANGLE Media office in Boston, Massachusetts. It's the Cube. Now here's your host, Dave Vellante. Hi everybody, welcome to this breaking analysis where we try to provide you some insights on the Cube. My name is Dave Vellante. I'm here with Jim Kabilis, who was up today. And Jim, we were just off of, of the, the VMworld 2019. Big show, a lot of energy, a lot of announcements. I specifically want to focus on containers and the impact that containers are having on VMware specifically, the broader ecosystem and the industry at large. So first of all, what was your take on VMworld 2019? Well, my take was that VMware is growing fast and they're investing in the future, which is you know, fairly clearly cloud native computing on containers with Kubernetes and all that. But really that's the future. And so you know, what VMware is doing is they're making significant bets that containers will rule the roost in cloud computing and application infrastructures going forward. But in fact, virtual machines, VMs, uh, hypervisors are, are hotter than ever and that was well established last week by the fact that the core predominant announcement last week was a VMware Tanzu, which is not yet a production solution but is in a limited preview which is the new platform for coexistence of containers in, on, on vSphere, uh, a container runtime embedded in vSphere, so that customers can run containers in a highly isolated workloads in a highly isolated VM environment. In other words, it's VMware saying to their, way of saying to their customers, you don't have to migrate away from VMs until you're good and ready. You can continue to run your and whatever containers you build uh, in, in, on vSphere, but we more than encourage you to continue to run uh, VMs until you're good and ready to migrate, if right. ever. So I want to come back and, and unpack that a little bit, but do you, does your data, does your analysis, um, when you're talking to customers and the, the industry at large, is there any evidence in, in, from what you see that containers are hurting VMware's business? I don't get any sense that containers are hurting VMware's business. I get the strong sense that um, Containers, uh, you know, they've just of course acquired Pivlar, very additive to the revenue mix at, at VMware. And VMware, most of their announcements last week were in fact are all around Kubernetes and containers and products that are very much for those customers who are going deep down the container road. So that was VMware's a setup question. VMware's got lots of products for, so, pro product for them. So it was a setup question. Yeah. So, so I have some data on this. I mean, you, Go ahead. Right answer. So <laughs> what I want to show you this. So Alex, if you wouldn't mind bringing up that, that slide, and we shared this with you last week when we were prepping for, for VMworld. This is data from Enterprise Technology Research, ETR, and they have a panel of 4,500 end user customers that they go out and do spending surveys with. So what this shows is, this is container customers spending on VMware. So you can see it goes back to early January. Now it's a little deceiving here, you see that big spike, but what, what, what this shows is that eight, that big spike, is the number of shared customers. So you really didn't have many customers back then that were doing both containers and VMware that, that ETR found. But as the N gets bigger, 186, 248, 257, 361, across those 461 customers, those are the shared customers in the green. And you can see that it's kind of a flat line. They've been just holding very well in the you know, high 30% range, which is their sort of uh, proprietary metric. So there's absolutely no evidence, Jim, that containers, to thus far anyway, are hurting VMware's business, which of course was the narrative, containers are going to kill VMware, no evidence of that. But then why would they acquire Pivotal? Is, are they concerned about the future? What's your opinion? Well, they're concerned about cro uh, really cross-selling their existing customer base who are primarily on vSphere and the hypervisor. Cross-selling them on the new world of Kubernetes-based products for cloud computing and so forth and so on. In other words, it's, it's all about how do they grow their revenue base. Uh, they, VM, VM, VMware has been around for was it more than 20 years now. They, they rule the roost on hypervisors. Where do they go from here in terms of their product mix? Well, Kubernetes and you know, beyond that, uh, you know, things like serverless would, clear, would clearly be in the range of the things that they could add on, their customers could add on to their existing deploys. I mean, look at Pivotal. Pivotal has a really strong Kubernetes uh, uh, distribution, which of course, VMware co-developed with them. Uh, uh, Pivotal also has a strong functions as a service backplane, the Pivotal functions service for serverless environments. So this acquisition of Pivotal very much positions VMware to capitalize on those opportunities, 
to sell those products when that market actually develops. But I see uh, some evidence that virtual machines are going as, uh, like gangbusters in terms of uh, customer deployments. Last week on theCUBE at VMworld, Mark Lohmeyer, who's an SVP at VMware for one of their cloud business unit, said that in the last year, for example, uh, customers who are using uh, VMware Cloud on AWS, they're, VMware grew the customer base by 400% last year and grew the number of VMs running in, the, in, in VMware Cloud and AWS by 900%, which would imply that on average, each customer more than double the number of VMs they're running on that particular cloud service. That means v, VMs are very much relevant now and probably will be going forward. And why is that? That's a good question, we can debate that. Well, so the naysayers at VMworld in the audience were tweeting that, oh, I thought we started Pivotal, we launched Pivotal so that we didn't have to run VMs uh, on, on or, or run containers on VM so we can run them on bare metal. Are people running containers on virtual machines? Well, they are, yes. In fact, there's a broad range of industry initiatives, not just Tanzu at, at VMware, to, to do just that, to run containers on VMs. I mean, there is the kubevert, uh, open source project under CNCF. That's been going for a couple of years now. Um, but also Google has Gvisor, uh, Intel has the Kata Containers Initiative. I believe that there are a few others. Oh yeah, AWS with Firecracker, last year's reInvent. Um, you know, all this would imply, strongly indicate that um, th these large cloud uh, and, and tech vendors wouldn't be investing heavily in the convergence of, of containers and VMs and hypervisors if there weren't a strong demand from customers for hybrid environments where they're going to run both stacks, as it were, uh, in, in parallel. Why? Well, one of the strong advantages of VMs is workload isolation at the hardware level, which is something that typically container runtimes don't offer. For example, that workload isolation seems to be one of the strong um, uh, features that uh, VMware is touting for Tanzu going forward. So VMware's a centerpiece of VMware strategy is obviously multi-cloud. Kubernetes is a linchpin uh, to enable running applications on different platforms. Will, in your opinion, and of course VMware is you know, hardcore enterprise, right? Mm -hmm. Will VMware two things? Will they be able to attract the developers, number one, and number two, will those developers build on top of VMware's platform or are they going to look to the cloud? Yeah, that's a, that's a very important question. I, last week at VMworld, I didn't get a sense that VMware has a strong developer story. Um, so, you know, I, I, don't, I think that's a really a, an open issue going forward for them. Um, why would a developer turn to VMware as their core solution provider um, when they don't offer a strong workbench for building these hybridized you know, VM slash containers slash serverless applications that seem to be springing up all over. I mean, AWS and Microsoft and Google are much stronger in that area with their respective portfolios. You know? So, I guess the obvious answer there is Pivotal is their answer to the developer quandary. Yes. And so, um, let's talk about that. So Pivotal was struggling. I, I talked last week in my analysis that you, know, the, you saw the IPO price and then it dipped down, it never made it back up. Essentially, the, the price that uh, that VMware paid the public shareholders for Pivotal was about half of its initial IPO price. Uh, so, okay, so the stock was struggling. Uh, the company didn't have the kind of momentum that I think that it wanted, so VMware picks it up. Can VMware fold in Pivotal and use its go-to-market and its, its largesse to really prop up Pivotal and make it a leader? Well. Possibly because Cloud Foundry, Pivotal Cloud Foundry, could be the linchpin of VMware's emerging developer story um, if they position it in, in that and really invest in the product in that regard. So yeah, in other words, this could very much uh, make VMware a go-to vendor for the developers who are building really the new generation of applications that present serverless functional interfaces, but I'll have containers under the cover, but also have VMs under the cover providing strong workload isolation in a multi-tenant environment. I mean, that, that, that's, that would be the promise. Now, a couple things. You mentioned uh, uh, Microsoft, of course, Azure in the cloud, and, and Google. The ETR data that I dug into, uh, when I wanted to understand, better understand multi-cloud, who's got the multi-cloud momentum? Well, guess what? Guess who has the most multi-cloud momentum? It's the cloud guys. Mm -hmm. um, now, AWS doesn't, 
specifically say they participate in multi-cloud, certainly their marketing suggests that you know, multi-cloud is for somebody else, that really they want to have unicloud. Um, and, and, and whereas Google and, and Azure kind of embracing um, multi-cloud and Kubernetes specifically. Now of course, AWS has a Kubernetes offering, but I suspect that it's not, not something that they want to promote hard in the marketplace because it makes it easier for people to get off of AWS. Your thoughts <coughs> on multi-cloud generally, but specifically Kubernetes and containers as it relates to the big cloud providers. Hmm. Yeah, well, my thoughts on multi-cloud generally is that um, multi-cloud is the strategy of the second tier cloud vendors, obviously. If they can't dominate the entire space, at least they can maintain a strong, um, provide a strong connective uh, tissue for the clouds that actually are deployed in their customers' environments. So in other words, uh, the Cisco's of the world, the VMware's of the world, uh, IBM, you know. In other words, these are not uh, among the top tier of the public cloud players. Hence, where do they go to remain relevant? Well, they provide the connective tissue and they provide the virtualized networking backbones and they provide the AI ops that enables end-to-end -end, uh, automated monitoring and management of the entire mesh. The whole notion of a mesh architecture is something that grew up with IBM and Google for lots of reasons, especially due to the fact that they themselves, as vendors, didn't dominate the public cloud. Well, so I agree with you. Uh, the only, the only uh, issue I would take is, is I think Microsoft is a leader in, 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 in public cloud, but because it has a big on-prem presence, it's in its best interest to push containers and Kubernetes and so forth, but, but you're right about the others. Cisco doesn't have a public cloud. You know, VMware doesn't have a public cloud. Um, IBM you know, has a public cloud, but it's really you know, small market share, and so it's in those companies, and, and Google is you know, behind, but it's in those companies' best interest really to promote multi-cloud, try to use it as a bulwark against AWS, who's got obviously awesome market momentum. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's interesting in the ETR data when I poke in there, it seems like there are more people looking at Google. Now maybe that's because they have such strong strength in data and analytics, maybe it's because they're looking for a hedge on, on AWS, but the spending data suggests that more and more people are kicking the tires and more than kicking the tires on, on Google. Um, who of course is obviously behind uh, uh, Kubernetes and that container movement and open source, your thoughts? Yeah, well you know, in many ways you have to think that Google uh, has, has developed the key pieces of the new stack for application development in the multi-cloud. Um, clearly, they, well they developed Kubernetes, it's open source, and uh, also they developed TensorFlow, open source, it's, you know, it is the predominant AI uh, workbench, essentially, for the new generation of AI-driven applications, which is everything. Uh, but also, if you look at, you know, Google developed uh, um, uh, Node.js uh, uh, for web applications and so forth. So really, Google now is the go-to vendor for the new generation of open source application development, and increasingly DevOps in a multi-cloud environment running over Istio meshes and so forth. So um, I, I think that's, uh, so you know, look, at, look at one of the, um, with the announcements last week at, at VMworld, uh, VMware and NVIDIA. Um, their announcement of their collaboration, their joint offering to enable um, uh, AI workloads, training workloads to run in, in GPUs in an optimal high performance fashion within a distributed uh, VMware uh, 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 you know, cloud end to end. So really, I think VMware recognizes that the new workloads are in the multi-cloud are predominantly, increasingly AI workloads. And in order to, um, you know, as the market goes towards that, those kinds of workloads, um, VMware very much recognizes they need to have a strong developer play. And they do with NVIDIA, in the sense that, very much so, because NVIDIA with the, the Rapids uh, framework and so forth, and NVIDIA being the predominant GPU vendor, um, very much is a, is a very strategic partner for VMworld, as, VMware as they're going forward as they hope to uh, uh, line up the AI developers, but Google still is the vendor to beat in, as regards the AI developers of the world in that regard, so. So we're entering a, a, a world we sometimes call it the post-virtual machine world. Uh, John Furrier is kind of tongue in cheek on a, a play on web 2.0, he calls it cloud 2.0, which is a world of multiple clouds. <coughs> 
as I've said many times, I'm not sure multi-cloud is necessarily a coherent strategy yet, as opposed to sort of a multi-vendor situation, shadow IT, yes. lines of business, et cetera. But Jim, thanks very much for, sure. for coming on and breaking down the, uh, the container market and VMworld 2019, it's great to see you. Yeah, likewise. All right, thank you for watching everybody. This is Dave Vellante with Jim Kabilis. We'll see you next time on theCUBE. Oh,